Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Thanks for joining us today for our Bible study on David. We all know David was far from perfect, yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. We can learn from David how to seek restoration with our Heavenly Father through honest repentance. What God saw in David, he can see in us. We too can be people after God's own heart. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge with today's message. Good morning. God's blessings to you today. Today we continue our study of the life of King David. This is week 14, and this is Awake Us Now. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We honor you. We stand in awe of you, and we bow before you in humility. We praise you for your goodness, your faithfulness throughout the ages, and we praise you that you turn all things around for good for the sake of your people. May that truth be impressed upon each of us this day as we study your word. And may we find ourselves taking refuge in you rather than being oppressed by the events around us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you. It's great to be with you again as we continue our study of David. I'll just say right up front, this is the story of an incredible national tragedy. And it would be very easy for us to uh, look at this story and just simply be filled with lament. But I believe we need to take a God's eye view of these events. Because you see, what is a national tragedy for the nation of Israel becomes something else because of the plan and purpose and intervention of God. And basically, what we're going to see today is a national tragedy as a prelude to national revival. And that's really what happens here. You know, Israel had gone through hundreds of years of distress during the period of the judges. The the nation of Israel, well, it's best described in the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Boy, does that sound like what's happening in our land today? And then finally, God gives them a king. And the king that is chosen is a man who stands tall amongst his fellows but who ends up wandering away from the living God more than that, rejecting God's plan and purpose and willfully pursuing his own desires. And he ends up a tragic death and bringing great tragedy upon the nation. But God intervenes, and all along God has been preparing for this day. And as a result, waiting in the wings is a man after God's own heart. So it's there I'd like to continue the study today. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 31, we're going to pick up where we had left off last time. And I'll I'll just quickly read verses 2 and 3. It says, The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons. They killed his son Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. What we have here is the battle taking place in the the midst of the Jezreel Valley and then up on to Mount Gilboa. And uh, here is a photo that I'd shared with you last week, a photo of the Jezreel Valley. This is frankly was and remains some of the most fertile farmland in all of Israel. But not only that, it is a natural passageway. In fact, the great Via Maris, the the way of the sea, an international highway, ran through the Jezreel Valley where this is all taking place. And so when the Philistines take over the Jezreel Valley, they not only split Israel in half, but they also seize one of the most important highways of antiquity along with all of the revenue that would be brought from that. And in addition to that, they take away the best farmland in the nation. And as a result, people are in desperate straits as a result of this incredible loss. But the loss goes far deeper than that. The loss includes not only the crown princes, but the loss includes the king himself. And that is one of the most tragic stories in all of the Bible. We read verse 4, Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. Saul is afraid of being humiliated and tortured. It's a measure of the incredible defeat that is being inflicted upon the Israelites in that their king is left alone, basically, in the face of the enemy. 
Uh, people are running like scared rabbits. And so the text continues, but his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer, all his men and all his men died together that same day. Saul dies not just a tragic death, but an ungodly death. We do not have the right to take our own lives. That is not something that, that God has given permission to do. We are told that we are not to murder, and that includes ourselves. Now, I think we have to be very upfront here. Many times people look upon suicide as a convenient way out. And as we're going to see in this story, it may have been a temporary convenient way out for Saul, but an incredible tragedy that brings on the entire nation as a result. And so we continue reading now in the scriptures, and uh, this is what we read. It says, verse 7, When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. And so what we have now is a continuing national tragedy. As the Israelites, the, the army just disperses. Many of them apparently go across the Jordan River. And all the people living in the Jezreel Valley, the surrounding towns on the hills, and even those across the Jordan, many people flee their own towns. And the Philistines come and they take whatever they can carry. It is a huge national loss, and it will have a ripple effect throughout the nation and throughout their economy. And it's at that point, then, that we read these words in verse 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 31. It says, The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. Mount Gilboa is a chain of hills and mounts, and uh, here's a photograph of it giving you an idea. You can see the Jezreel Valley down below, and then the, the multiple peaks on uh, what is known as the Range of Gilboa. It's there that Saul and his men died. The Philistines have been in, you know, fast-paced pursuit of the fleeing Israelites. They don't take time to look over what remains on the, the mountain. They just keep following the, the Israelite army that is dispersing in every direction, and the Philistines begin taking all sorts of plunder. It's at that point, then, that the Scripture continues with these words. Verse 9, after they had found Saul and his three sons, it says, they cut off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And then we read this. When the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Bethshan. Now, Bethshan is located near the Jordan River. It, it is a, one of the, the most um, extensively excavated sites in all of modern Israel. It has a history that goes back to the time of the ancient Canaanites. And uh, it is the place then where Saul's body is taken along with the bodies of his sons. And they're hung on the wall of one of the pagan temples at Beth Shan. By the way, it says... And when the, uh, the people from Jabesh Gilead saw this, they came during the night. And what they did is they traveled about 12 miles or so under the cover of darkness to go to Beth Shan to bring back Saul's body. And you ask yourselves the question, when everybody else is fleeing, why do the men of Beth Shan or Jabesh Gilead, rather, have the courage to go to Bethshan in the heart of the Philistine army to take down the bodies of their king and princes? And the answer most likely is this. Remember, Saul was the one who had delivered the people of Jabesh Gilead at the beginning of his reign. At a time when the Israelites on the eastern shore of the Jordan River were being oppressed by Nahash, 
we read that Saul called all Israel to battle and ended up saving the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. They don't forget what the king has done. And even though the king had wandered away from God, had brought tragedy upon the nation, they were men of honor and men of courage in the face of their fellow countrymen fleeing in fear. They came to Beth Shan, and uh, there we read, they took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh, where they burned them. Now, by the way, Burial by cremation was not the usual Jewish way of doing things. Why did they do that here? The answer is they got to the bodies after they had been dead for a period of many hours. And in all likelihood, the bodies are decaying. So they, they burn the bodies. But as we'll see in a second, they keep the bones because they believe in the resurrection. And they're looking forward to the day when God raises the dead. That has been at the heart of the faith of the Jewish people going all the way back. And uh, if I may uh, share these, this picture, this is a picture of Beth Shan. Uh, by the way, the ruins that you see here are from the Roman era. But in the background, you see this massive tell, this huge hill. At the top, we have discovered a couple of temples, an Egyptian temple and a Canaanite temple. And it's somewhere up there where the bodies of Saul and his sons were hung as, as a, basically as a victory trophy, uh, a, uh, an offering to the pagan gods of the Philistines and the Canaanites. And so the text then continues as we read these words. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. They mourned the loss of their king. They recognized the tremendous national tragedy that occurred, but they also turned to God with fasting and prayer. And uh, that sets the stage for what comes next. What comes next is not merely national tragedy. What comes next is the beginning of national revival. And so on that note, we move into 2 Samuel chapter 1, where we read these words. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. Okay, so David and his men have left the Philistine army gotten back to Ziklag, found it burned. They go chasing after the, the Amalekites who had destroyed their town, recaptured all of their families and all of their goods. They come back to Ziklag and they are there for two days when something takes place on the third day. And this is what we read. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. By the way, that is the ancient way of showing grief and, and sorrow over great loss. Uh, clothes that have been rent asunder and dust on the head is a sign of repentance and sadness and sorrow and death. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. And this then is how the text continues. Where have you come from? Verse 3, David asked him. He answered, I've escaped the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. Now, keep in mind, this is in a day before network news, before the development of radio, before the Internet, before being able to text and phone and, and be in constant contact with everyone. David has heard nothing from the battlefield. He left before the battle began. He underwent a time of great sorrow and loss with the destruction of this town and the kidnapping of his, his wives and the families of his men. And now, after all that period of time, on the third day, it's interesting how things so often happen on the third day in the Bible. On the third day, this man arrives from Saul's camp. And David asked him, what happened? Give me the whole story. I need to hear what's going on. They can see that the man has displayed all of the signs of sorrow and loss. The man says, 
The men fled from battle. Many of them fell and died. And Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. By the way, keep in mind, Jonathan is David's best friend. This is not just a national tragedy. This is a personal tragedy of the highest order. The individual who had been so loyal to David, who by rights should have been the successor of King Saul, but willingly accepted God's word that David was the man who would succeed him. Now Jonathan is dead. And you can begin to comprehend the kind of emotional turmoil that hits David, because just in a matter of a few days, he's lost his home, he lost his family for a time, then they found him again, and there was joy and rejoicing, and now comes this. And he is on an emotional roller coaster ride. Verse 6, or verse 5, rather. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? David wants to make sure there is concrete evidence here. He's not just going to go on hearsay. How do you know? How do you know that Saul and Jonathan have died? And the man says, I happen to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on his spear with chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. By the way, uh, that would ring true. We know the Philistines had, you know, David had been with the Philistine army just days earlier. He knew they had a substantial number of chariots. He knew they had a large number of men. And hearing the report that Saul was leaning on his spear, Saul carried his spear with him. And the implication that he's leaning on it means he is so badly wounded that he needs something to hold him up. Verse 7, when he turned around and saw me, he called out to me and I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. Uh, do you see the irony here? King Saul lost his position as king because he refused to bring full vengeance on the Amalekites. He refused to kill the Amalekite king. And now here is this man coming from Saul's camp saying, I'm the one who killed him. He asked me to kill him. And he's an Amalekite. Saul doesn't kill an Amalekite king. And this man says, I, an Amalekite, killed King Saul. Well, the text continues. Verse 10, the man says, so I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. And this young man thinks I am going to get a reward. Yes, he does, but not what he expected. Now, at this point, there are some obvious questions. How do we how do we take these two accounts, the one from 1 Samuel 31 and this one from 2 Samuel 1, and how do we harmonize them? In 1 Samuel 31, we're told that Saul fell on his own sword. Here now we have a young man saying, he asked me to kill him, and I did. And there are a number of possibilities. The one possibility is that Saul fell on his own sword, but didn't die. And in the throes of death, saw this Amalekite and said, hey, finish me off, would you? The other possibility is that this young man is lying. And David is no fool. You have to ask yourself the question, if this man was an Amalekite, what was he doing on the battlefield? I mean, seriously, who in his right mind would go in the midst of a battle and talk to the enemy king and, uh, you know, say, what can I do for you? It doesn't ring true. And not only that, it makes sense that David would respond with, with righteous indignation. Because here's this man who has now brought King Saul's crown 
and armband. He's saying, in effect, here, David, you're king now, thanks to me. And David will have none of it. This is what we read. It says, Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. And then verse 12, They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. This is one of the most horrific days in all of Israel's history. And David and his men are in deep mourning and deep sorrow and deep grief. Verse 13, David said to the young man who brought him the report, Where are you from? I'm the son of a foreigner, an Amalekite, he answered. David asked him, Why weren't you afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, Go, strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. With your own mouth you testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. David recognizes that God has given the commission to the children of Israel to destroy the Amalekites. And now here comes an Amalekite saying, I killed the king of Israel. Whether he was lying or telling the truth, he gets precisely what he, was, what he deserved to receive according to the word that God had given to King Saul, to Samuel, and also then to David. Some have looked at this and said, well, David is just in a fit of grief and he takes it out on this young man. But this young man is a scoundrel, just an absolute scoundrel, one who has pillaged the battlefield. At best, he simply plundered a corpse. At worst, he killed a king. And David orders swift justice for this man who was an enemy not just of the people of Israel, but of God. Well, that is not where the text ends. Instead, we read these words. Verse 17 and 18. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jasher. What is the book of Jasher, by the way? It's mentioned two times here in the Hebrew Scriptures. Once in 2 Samuel and the second time in the book of Joshua. We are able, on the basis of the evidence that we have in Scripture, to piece a few things together. First of all, book of Jasher, the Hebrew literally means the scroll of the righteous. And it appears what the book of Jasher contained were poems, poetry, songs, highlighting Israel's history, God's deliverance, God's provision, God's work amongst them. The book itself, the scroll of the righteous, the book of Jasher, has been lost. We, we do not have a copy of it. There have been a number of, uh, a number of false copies, fakes, <laughs> that have been produced over the years, one as late as just a couple centuries ago, but uh, the book itself has been lost. You never know. Someday it may be found. You know, we continue to find things in the Dead Sea region. Who knows? Someday this one may show up as well. But what follows now is a song of lament that David wrote. And many scholars have looked at this and said this is one of the finest pieces of Hebrew poetry found anywhere in the Old Testament scriptures. David composes it in the midst of deep grief. It is a phenomenal presentation and a reminder that David is not just a great leader. He's not just a great warrior. He is not just a man after God's own heart. He is a man also who expresses the heart of God in song and in poetry. David is the author of about half of the Psalms. And now, in this great, this great work of art, he reflects on the national tragedy. This is what David writes. 
Verse 19. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Have you heard that phrase before? How the mighty have fallen. It goes all the way back to the Hebrew Scriptures. It was written first by David. Later authors picked it up. But David is the first one to write these words. And he writes that a gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. The, the root word of the, the Hebrew word for gazelle is the root glory. And, and it truly is a, a, a double entendre in many ways. Uh, David is saying a gazelle, this, this gracious and incredibly beautiful animal, but also this glorious thing lies dead, slain on your heights, Israel. David does not denounce King Saul. The man who had hunted David for many months, for years, David does not make fun of him. He does not glory in his death. He does not denounce him. David realizes this is a tragedy for the whole nation. And it's also a tragedy for him personally. And so David continues... And he says, tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Keep in mind, when David had brought great victory to Israel, what did the daughters of Israel sing? They sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And now David is saying, don't let the Philistines start singing songs about their victory over the children of Israel. He writes, mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold, because when the nation was secure... People prospered, and now the nation is rent asunder, and it brings great loss. David writes, how the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. And then he says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Your love was wonder for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. By the way, or that of women, rather. By the way, many have pointed to this in recent days and have suggested that David and Jonathan were having a homosexual affair. There is nothing in the Scripture to support that in any way, shape, or form. And by the way, the ancient Hebrews, they maintained that that kind of behavior was an abomination before God. It is denounced in the Torah. There is nothing in here that is unseemly. What David is saying, I've lost my best friend. He's my closest friend. He's the one I could talk to the most openly. I've lost him, and I am devastated personally. And so David concludes with these words. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. And that is the story of Israel's great tragedy. But with it also come the seeds of Israel's great revival. And what we're going to see as we move on in the study of David is, God will use this man and those who follow him to bring an incredible revival in the nation of Israel. And it's a reminder to us in those times when we feel most depressed about the events of the world around us, we need to focus on the power of God because God can take what human beings destroy and he can rebuild it in ways that no one could ever have imagined. He is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or imagine. So we ought to ask because Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we pray for revival. We thank you for the way you revived the nation of Israel under David. 
We pray in our day that you would revive our land, that you would turn the hearts of people back to you, that there would be many who now are living in darkness, who would come into the light of your presence and who would become people after God's own heart. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you same time, same place next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to having you with us again next time. If you would like more information about Awake Us Now, go to awakeusnow.com.